Do you know what time it is? It's supernatural story time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only in the dark. The Cowboy's Ghost, Volumes 2, Story Number 1. Allison Eiley Oram was the Grand Dame of early Nevada. An early settler in the Washoe Valley, she was one of the extraordinary women of Western America, winning and losing her fortune by the tumultuous boom and bust conditions of the mining frontier. Born in Scotland on September 6, 1826, Eiley married when she was 15 and moved to Great Salt Lake soon after with Stephen Hunter, her devoutly Mormon husband. It would be the last time she wrote on the coattails of any man. In a time when divorce was not a realistic option for so many women, young Eiley left her husband soon after they arrived in America. The reasons behind the separation are forgotten by history, but whatever they were, they did not spoil the idea of marriage for the Scot. She married another Mormon named Alexander Cowan in 1853. Two years later, man and wife moved to what is now Nevada. Acting as Mormon missionaries, the two set up a ranch near present-day Genoa, moving on to the Washoe Valley in western Nevada about one year later. While Eiley was already an anomaly <clears throat> among women in her willingness to settle on the rough fringes of American civilization, she became one of the legendary figures of the region. When she decided to stay behind in the Washoe Valley, after her husband was called back to Utah, by the Mormon order. Effectively ending her marriage to Alexander Cowan, it was not long before she was rewarded for her bold independence. Moving south to a small mining camp called John Town, she set up a boarding house, supplying miners with decent rooms in a rough settlement where tents were the common shelter. The move was fortuitous. In 1859, gold was discovered on a nearby hill and miners swamped into the region, bringing a suddenly booming business to the enterprising young woman. She was not content to live off the earnings of the miners, however, and soon got involved in mining herself. Living in the region before the rush of miners began, Eileen had her pick of the mining plots along Gold Hill. One of her claims bordered on another claim owned by one Lemuel Sandy Bowers. The handsome young Scotsman developed a deep admiration for Eileen's dauntless ambition, and the two were wed under fortunate auspices because both their claims began churning out incredible amounts of wealth. Eileen and Sandy Bowers became Nevada's first two millionaires. Tapping into the enormous Comstock load, the couple became the recipients of more money than they had ever dared to imagine. This abundance of cash greased the wheels of their nuptial arrangements and a true and lasting love formed between them. But with greater wealth came greater potential for tragedy. The more one has, the more one has to lose. Fortune's pattern of generous bestowal and cruel deprivation did not spare the Bowers. The twist of fate Eileen would suffer throughout the rest of her days turned her attention to mystical forces, and she spent the last years of her life engrossed in the spirit world, looking to the denizens of the underworld for guidance, until she became one of those spirits herself. The Bowers' impending misfortunes arrived along with their first two children, who both died in their infancy. Perhaps the Bowers were seeking some respite from the sorrow of these losses when they commissioned their mansion to be built and took off on a ten-month trip through Europe. They came back to the newly constructed mansion along with a child whom they had adopted somewhere in the Scottish Highlands. Eileen was never forthcoming about the girl's background. But the Bowers would not have too much time to enjoy any familial happiness. Soon after they returned, their minds began to run out. Outstanding debts suddenly loomed large before the Bauer family, and their savings and income rapidly deteriorated. By the time Sandy went to their mines on Gold Hill to oversee the operation, the ore had all but run out. Poverty, however, was not an issue. Mr. Bauer had to contend with for too long. With a broken heart and lungs full of rock dust, Sandy died of silicosis early in 1868. Eileen was alone again doing everything she could to raise her adopted daughter in a world that was decidedly hostile to independent women. She turned her mansion into a boarding house in hopes of paying off her debts, but her efforts were in vain. She became more removed from reality as her fortunes plummeted. 
yet it was in 1874 when her daughter died after her appendix burst in a Reno boarding school that Eileen's worldview changed dramatically. She lost her mansion in a public auction in 1876 and spent the rest of her life dabbling in the spirit world, making a meager living looking into her crystal ball, giving superstitious clients a look into their futures for a small price. She also claimed she could communicate with spirits of the departed and charge to deliver messages to clients' deceased loved ones. Spending the rest of her days wandering between California and Nevada, the once incredibly wealthy mine proprietor spent her last days in an Oakland, California poorhouse. She died on October 27, 1903. But that would not be the last the world would hear of Eileen Bowers. Strange things began to happen in the Bowers mansion soon after she passed away. There were reports of mysterious sounds coming from deserted hallways and rooms. People described them as shuffling sounds. Objects were being moved about as if someone were looking for a missing possession, emptying closets, nightstands, and dressers but investigations never revealed any intruder, just an empty, rearranged chamber. Other people claimed to see a stately-looking matriarch, dressed in Victorian splendor, standing stoically before one of the mansion's windows, looking out on the estate's sprawling grounds. The woman was described as broad, with short, dark hair and hard features, descriptions that matched the portraits of the same legendary entrepreneur who had the mansion built. These sightings have increased dramatically since the Bauer Mansion was opened for tours. Many believe Eileen is returning for a crystal ball which is displayed in the mansion today. Others think that her spirit is reliving those few days of happiness when she was living in the mansion with her daughter and husband before the cruel hands of fate tore their household apart. Next story. It might require a stretch of the imagination to see it now, but at one time the town of Bodie, California, was the liveliest place on the eastern slope of the Sierra Nevada, or maybe deadliest, might be a better word. The first men to arrive in the area were gold miners, who had gotten wind of Waterman S. Bodie's modest gold strike just north of Mono Lake, near the Nevada-California border in 1859. A year later, only about 20 miners lived in the region, 20 men driven by ambition or insanity, who came to live among the freezing peaks of the high Sierras in hopes of striking gold. Within two decades, this pitiful rock-scrabbling operation became the great golden Golconda of the West, and the handful of shacks and tents that housed the original prospectors were transformed into the tremendous and terrible town of Bodie. It has been said that of the over 10,000 frontier adventurers who choked Bodie streets in 1880, there might have been maybe a dozen or so decent personalities. But for the rest of them, greed, treachery, and mutual enmity was the rule. The Roaring Burg attracted the worst of that cast of desolate denizens who were found in the Dodges, Tombstones, and Abilenes of the country. The gunfighters, gamblers, prostitutes, and con men who made the Wild West what it was. And while Bodie's gold rush lasted for less than a decade, the madness and mayhem that was planted there during those few short years can still be felt today. Not that there are any outlaws remaining in Bodie at this time. One of the country's best preserved ghost towns, Bodie has been made into a state historic park that draws in thousands of tourists a year. While the real town was hastily vacated after the gold ran out and fires destroyed most of the Bodie's buildings, the ghost town's dramatic history has assured that it will never be forgotten. And it continues to be a popular destination for curiosity seekers, Western enthusiasts, and those who have a penchant for the supernatural. Indeed, many visitors to the abandoned burg have had experiences that suggest that history isn't quite done with Bodhi. Countless occurrences, strange and inexplicable, have been reported in Bodhi over the years. Park employees and visitors alike have seen lights flash on and off in long deserted buildings. Mysterious apparitions have been spotted drifting across the town's graveyard around nightfall. The sounds of distant music and boisterous conversation have often been heard within a few Bodie households, and people passing by the standard mine shaft have sworn to have heard chains rattling and men grunting within. But of all the strange things that have occurred in the ghost town, none is more talked about 
then the spirit in the Kane House. Constructed in 1873, the quaint little building was home to J.S. Kane, one of Bodie's first settlers. According to legend, Kane was one of the wealthier residents of Bodie, having made a tidy sum off land speculation in and around town, purchasing most of his real estate just before the gold rush began. Able to afford luxuries most men in Bodie could only dream about, Kane built his home, moved his wife into it, and hired a Chinese maid to look after the mess. In a time when there were precious few women in the West, a man with a wife was enviable enough, but someone privileged enough to keep two women was a rare thing indeed. So it was that J.S. Kane's living arrangements was the subject of a good deal of town gossip. After slogging away their days in the mine shaft, bitter miners would spend a little too much of their leisure time speculating on the sorts of things that went on in the Kane harem as they threw back shots of whiskey. Bodhi residents tittered and clucked whenever they walked past Kane's house, shouting jokes and obscenities at the walls and windows. This attention wasn't lost on Kane's wife, Ella, who quickly grew to resent the presence of the household maid. It didn't help that the maid was an exceedingly beautiful woman who got just a little too much notice from Ella's husband. Ella soon became bent on ending the woman's tenure at her house. Kane was able to hold off his wife for a short while, but it wasn't long before he realized that we would have to let the maid go. The problem was that the Chinese woman spoke next to no English, and while she understood enough to know that Kane was firing her, she couldn't comprehend why. For Kane's part, he could never have known how much the job meant to her. Perhaps she was sending her wages back to a family that was desperately in need of them in China, or maybe she was so frightened by her foreign surroundings that she couldn't comprehend life without the security of the Kane household. Whatever the case, the poor young woman was devastated. She hanged herself in her bedroom on her last night in the Kane house. While there are no accounts of strange happenings in the house immediately after the maid killed herself, there is reason to believe that her tortured spirit lingered on there after she took her life. In recent years, the Kane house has been used as sleeping quarters for rangers working in Bodie Historic Park. It is the experience of park employees quartering in the Kane house that have kept the legend of the Chinese maid alive. Some have woken from fitful sleeps to see a beautiful Chinese woman standing at the foot of their bed staring at them with an unforgettable look of fierce loathing and inexpressible sorrow. By the time these frightened witnesses sit up in alarm, the woman has vanished, leading many who have heard this story to offer that these strangers may have been dreaming. This might very well have been the case, if it wasn't for the vividness of the vision, the fear pounding through witnesses' hearts, and the image's continued appearance over the years. Those visions say nothing of the other things that have occurred in the Kane house. Some haven't seen the Chinese maid so much as they felt her, waking up to a horrifying suffocating sensation, as if a force was somehow physically constricting their lungs. Those who try to get up find their limbs pinned to their bed, the experience never lasts for more than several seconds, not long enough to cause any lasting harm, but enough to convince employees who have experienced it never to sleep in the house again. When she isn't suffocating park employees, the unhappy spirit has also been known to swing doors open and slam them shut, turn lights on and off, and cause temperatures in the house to plummet. Her presence is always marked by the same strong sense of foreboding. No one who has had any experience with the Kane house maid is too eager to go back. Of course, the Kane house is only one story among many in Bodie, California. Many have contended that the entire town is haunted. Psychically sensitive visitors sense it through the whole ghost town, a vague yet powerful energy from the past that fills the town with an intangible air of antiquity that exceeds the real age of the ghost town. This sensation has probably done the most to feed the legend of the curse, of Bodhi in the popular mind. Since the ghost town was made into a historic site, park policy has deemed that visitors aren't permitted to take anything from the ghost town. By law, not a pebble, button, or splinter of the wood can be touched. Yet those who have defied this regulation and made away with a small keepsake to remember Bodhi are never happy with their souvenirs. Most often than not, these mementos bear strange weight with people who have taken them. Sometimes it is said the individuals with pieces of boat in their possession come under a streak of bad luck in their lives, losing loved ones or suffering financial difficulty or personal injury. Virulent fits of insomnia, lagging energy, and bad mood swings 
have also been attributed to relics from Bodhi. Yet the curse is not said to be permanent, for those who return their stolen items to the park are said to be instantly liberated from the grip of the ghost town. It is a curse that has been taken very seriously. Over the years, thousands of minute items taken from the park grounds have been mailed back to Bodhi in unmarked packages. Apparently the ghosts of the old boom town are interested to visit, but no one wants to live there. Next story. In the spring of 1876, nothing too delicate, refined, or precious lived long in Deadwood. An illegal settlement in hostile Sioux territory, Deadwood was populated by roughly 5,000 of the frontier's worst men, who flocked to the area in 1875, soon after gold was discovered in the Black Hills. The cry of gold in the Dakota Territory drew in every desperate drifter from the Rio Grande to the upper Missouri. The mining camp was chock full of gold diggers, gamblers, and bad men, a murderous fraternity of mostly young males who would gladly sell their own livers, or better yet the livers of the man next to them, for a flash in the pan. During daylight hours they teamed over the surrounding hills digging desperately for the shining metal they coveted more than life. After the sun went down, most of them retreated into the ramshackle collection of fetid tents scattered across the bottom of Deadwood Gulch. There they spend the night making their unique brand of hell. During the first months of his existence, most of Deadwood's gambling houses and saloons were nothing more than huge tents where enterprising men set up crude tables and doled out shots of rot gut whiskey for inflated prices. But development came quickly to this mining community. By 1876, most of Deadwood's business establishments were false-fronted wooden buildings lined up along broad dirt boulevards. Yet while conditions in Deadwood improved, the behavior of its desolate citizens largely remained the same. Life was cheap in the rough-and-tumble mining town. Most of the men who lived there were possessed by a rivulent gold fever, which relegated every other sense and sensibility to the periphery. Deadwood saloons became dens of homicidal jealousy and bitter intemperance. Men would come to drink, mull, and mutter over the gold and grievances of the day. Whiskey, frustration, and firearms made for a volatile mixture, and liquor-soaked gunfights became an all-too-frequent form of expression in the lawless town. Things got worse and worse, until the legendary gunfighter Wild Bill Hailcock was shot through the back of the head while he was playing cards at the saloon number 10. That was when Seth Bullock stepped onto the scene. He was Deadwood's first sheriff, a man who possessed such a stern authoritarian mien that he was often mistaken for an Earp brother. The sort of man who was able to bring violent men to reason with a single glance. Seth Bullock was a natural leader among the men of the West who were inclined to take too many liberties in the lawless conditions of the frontier. One could say that Seth was born into this role of Western peacemaker, having spent most of his boyhood railing against the stifling order of his father, a retired officer in the British military. And while much of his youth was passed resisting such stern parental control, when he rode out west in 1867, an ambitious 18-year-old hoping to make his fortune in the Montana Territory, he took the authority of his father with him. It shone from behind his flashing eyes, an informal unspoken edict that practically every man in the west understood with a glance. Distinguishing himself as a man of the law in Montana throughout the late 1860 and early 1870s, he had already served as a member of the Territorial Senate and a county sheriff by the time he followed the gold rush to Deadwood in 1876. Upon arriving in Deadwood, the first thing Seth became aware was a need for order. Sending his bride and their daughter to their Michigan home, he promptly went about the business of shaping up the chaotic community. After he was appointed sheriff, it did not take long. Becoming the unbending father to every bad man in Deadwood, Seth and his cadre of armed deputies brought law to the Black Hills. Peace was made in the turbulent town of Deadwood with nearly no shots fired. With law came respectability, and Seth Bullock became known across the western states as one of the premier agents of civilization. The energetic Bullock took advantage of his reputation. He built up one business after another, opening a hardware shop and hotel in Deadwood and a ranch along the Belforce River, all the while dedicating time to wildlife conservation in the Black Hills. This great western pioneer would eventually found 
the town of Belfort, and win the confidence of none other than Teddy Roosevelt, the Rough Riding 26th President of the United States. When Seth Bullock died in September 1919, his emaciated old frame, aged far beyond his 70 years, he had become something of a legend in the land west of the Missouri River. But, as all of us know, legends don't die easy. While Seth Bullock's remains were buried atop Mount Moriah on a plot that overlooks Deadwood, many residents of the South Dakota community have reason to believe Seth's spirit still lives in the town he named. His place of residence, the Bullock Hotel. Dating back to the 19th century, the Bullock Hotel is a living piece of Deadwood's history. Originally Seth Bullock's hardware store, the building was rebuilt as a hotel in 1895 after it was destroyed by fire. Seth oversaw the reconstruction of the hotel himself, wanting it to be distinct from the shoddy saloons and brothels that abounded in town. When it was finished, the Bullock Hotel stood as a fine example of Victorian luxury in a place where luxury was scarce. It was considered to be the best accommodation for miles around, at one time housing the likes of President Theodore Roosevelt. The pride of Deadwood, while its founder was alive, the hotel began falling apart after Seth passed on. Years brought careless owners, cobwebs in the corners, rot in the rafters, and peeling paint. As time passed, the number of guests frequenting the hotel dropped off dramatically and the building fell into anonymity. Its rich history lost in the record of Deadwood's days. That was until 1988, when an energetic woman by the name of Mary Schmidt bought the Bullock Hotel, planning to restore the establishment to its previous condition. The ensuing renovations brought out the ghost or ghosts of the Bullock Hotel. First indications of the oddness in the hotel were minor renovators cursed about their frequently mislaid tools, wondering how the hammer they had just put down was now on the other side of the room, or why doors they had left open were slammed shut behind them when there wasn't the slightest hint of a draft in the building. Before long, the occurrences in the hotel began to get weirder. Some miners claimed to hear the sound of cowboy boots on the wooden floors, spurs jangling in time with an invisible someone's slow measured steps. Others claimed to hear a faint whisper through the clamor of renovations, a young girl saying their names in a barely audible voice. Among these workers' reports of strange happenings in the hotel were also the stories of sightings of Seth Bullock, a tall skinny man in worn clothing, dusty boots, and a beaten up cowboy hat would just appear out of nowhere only to vanish again in another instant. While these experiences put off some renovators, they all knew that once the job was finished they would be able to leave the hotel behind them. For those residents of Deadwood working in the Bullock Hotel after it was reopened, the spirits haunting that building would become a part of their day-to-day -day lives. Diane, who has worked at the Bullock Hotel's front desk for many years, has long since grown accustomed to the building's peculiarity. There have been numerous reports of strange happenings since I started working here, she said. I mean, anywhere from four to six stories a month. Most of those stories involve the spirits of a friendly, helpful, if often mischievous, Seth Bullock. One of the most famous encounters with Seth's spirit occurred a few years before, she describes. A little boy staying here with his family left his room late one night to go looking for his parents, who were in for a little gambling in the hotel's gaming hall. Well, this little boy ended up getting lost in the hotel. He was wandering aimlessly down one of the halls, crying his eyes out, when a tall man stopped him. What happened next is something of a local legend in Deadwood. What's the matter, boy? the man asked gently. I can't find my mom, the child answered, trying his hardest to hold back his tears. Come now, the stranger said, smiling kindly. Your mom and pa are having a little bit of fun at cards. Why don't you be a big boy and let them wind down a bit? The tall man took off his worn cowboy hat and ran a hand through his dark hair. Besides, it's late, and I'm sure your folks be cross if they knew you were wandering around when you should be sleeping. The man's gentle reasoning got through to the boy, and he nodded silent agreement, suddenly realizing how sleepy he was. Now, why don't you tell me what room you're staying in, and I'll take you there. A few minutes later, the friendly stranger was standing in front of the sweet door with the kid. That a boy smiled at his ward, who had stopped crying and had just produced a massive yawn. Now have a good night's sleep. With that, the tall man in the cowboy hat patted the boy on the shoulder and said goodbye, waiting until the boy closed the door behind him before he walked away. 
The next morning, the boy told his parents about the incident. Neither his mother nor father were happy that their child had been wandering through the hotel by himself, but they were grateful that he had met the good man in the hallway. It wasn't until they were checking out of the hotel later on that morning that they discovered who the man in the hallway actually was. That's him, Mom. That's him, the boy exclaimed, tugging on his mother's sleeve. Both mother and father looked to where their child was pointing. There on the wall was a portrait of Seth Bullock, the hotel's founder. The boy's father laughed. So, we have a dead cowboy to thank for finding you? But his mother, taking one look at the earnestness in her child's eyes, took her son seriously. Are you sure that's the man, baby? That was when the woman working the desk piped up. He isn't the only one that's seen him. Old Seth Bullock's ghost has been hanging around this hotel for years. Diane wasn't working at the Bullock Hotel when this event to happened, but to this day it stands as one of the most dramatic manifestations of Seth Bullock's ghost. Not that the old Westerner limits his activity to helping lost children. Seth Bullock doesn't do any real harm, Diane said, but he can be a bit on the mischievous side. Much of his mischief in the Bullock Hotel involves supernatural flirtation with a female guest. Diane recalled one of the old proprietor's recent pranks. In September 2002, a woman who was staying in the hotel with her husband had an encounter with Seth. The couple knew the story about Seth's ghost, and when they were checking in, told me that they were hoping to see him. Well, they would never actually lay eyes on Seth when they were here, but it did seem like he paid them a visit. She told me about her experience when they were checking out the next day. This woman was woken up in the middle of the night by a hand on her hip. Oh man, she thought to herself, my husband is being amorous again. She turned over to face him, but found that he was fast asleep on his side with his back to her. There was no possible way that he was the one who had just touched her. Yep, I told her the next morning, that's Seth. Indeed, Seth Bullock must have been quite a ladies' man during his earthly years, for many women staying at the hotel have reported similar experiences. Some women taking showers have said that the door to the bathroom has swung open by itself. Others say that they've had strong feelings of being watched while combing their hair in the mirror. Not one of them has ever told me they felt threatened. It's actually sort of the opposite. They felt almost amused at the attention of what they're certain is a friendly presence. Everyone who's had contact with Seth comes away with the feeling that they've shared a laugh with a kindly old man. Many of our guests have heard a story or two about Seth and come to the hotel hoping to have a run-in with him. But there is reason to believe that Seth's spirit isn't the only one that haunts the Bullock Hotel. Norm Stevens who worked just down the street at Miss Kitty's, was employed at the Bullock Hotel from 1989 to 1993. During that time, he had a number of supernatural experiences, and while he's certain that he brushed shoulders with the ghost of Seth Bullock on more than one occasion, he's also convinced that his most poignant supernatural experiences were with another spirit. Around the turn of the century, a typhoid epidemic went through Deadwood. It's a horrible way to go. The Bullock Hotel was used as a hospital at that time and a lot of people died of typhoid in that building. Most of Norm's experiences in the hotel were with the spirit of a little girl who he was convinced died of typhoid during the epidemic. When nobody was there and I was downstairs in my office doing paperwork, I'd hear her calling me, asking me what I was up to. It was always the same. Norman, what are you doing? Norm never felt threatened by the sound of the little girl's voice, but the hair would rise in the back of his neck nevertheless. There would never be any trace of a girl in the room. The hotel security system corroborated Norm's hunch that something was amiss in the basement of the hotel. We had motion detectors down there, Norm says, and they would often go off when nobody was down there. It happened more than once, where the motion detectors would indicate that something was moving downstairs, but the cameras monitoring the area wouldn't pick up a thing. Whatever was moving down there, it was invisible. While Norm Stevens is sure the ghost of a typhoid victim haunts the hotel along with Seth Bullock, he states, that there may very well be other spirits in the Bullock Hotel as well. If this is truly the case, at least it can be said that the ghost of Seth Bullock isn't alone. Perhaps the dead still consider the Bullock Hotel to be the best place to stay, just as visitors to dead would believe it to be when Seth was alive. Next story. Henry Lambert stared at the five cards in front of him. 
trying his best to stop a smile from creeping to the corners of his mouth. There were five hearts in his hand, arranged in order from six to ten, a straight flush. Lambert let his eyes wander to the five other men sitting around the table, going from one man to the next until they stopped on the famous Thomas Wright, one of the most celebrated card players on the frontier. Here I am, out in New Mexico, Lambert thought to himself, playing poker at a high-stakes table with the one and only Tom Wright, and I've got a straight flush in my hands. As far as Lambert was concerned, things couldn't get any better. God knows it's been long enough coming, he thought, as he looked around at the drunken revelry in his Pax Cimarron saloon, but I finally made it. The blithe Frenchman downed a shot of whiskey and looked back at the table, which was groaning under the weight of cash, gold, and personal valuables gathered in the center. He looked at his cards again and smiled. All mine. A French immigrant who had taken the trip across the Atlantic in the 1850s, Lambert was a young man with his head full of romantic notions about the American West when he arrived in the United States. He left France determined to test his mettle in the wide-open wildness of the American frontier. Fanciful notion of the savage nobility of American Indians, the unrefined gallantry of Texas and the limitless possibilities of the western horizon were dancing through his mind. More than anything else, young Henry yearned for the wild places and he made a promise to himself that as soon as he saved enough money to make the passage, he would try his luck in the California gold fields. Fate, however, had different plans for him, for Henry Lambert had one talent that elevated him above other men, and it wasn't toughness, skill at cards, or proficiency with a six-shooter. Henry Lambert could cook, or maybe calling what he did in the kitchen cooking isn't quite right. The young Frenchman had been alive for over two decades and had yet to meet a man who could throw together a better meal than he. Lambert was an artist, a genius, and anyone who tried his foie gras, glazed duck, or quail eggs in hollandaise sauce would be hard-pressed to disagree. Of course, Lambert didn't think that such a skill would serve him well on the rough fringes of frontier America, and he planned to use his talent purely as a means to get him to California. Getting work as a chef in an upscale New York restaurant, Henry Lambert began cooking in the New World with exactly this purpose in mind. But it wouldn't be that simple. The moment wealthy New Yorkers got a taste of Lambert's prodigious talents, he was elevated to culinary stardom. Every night, people clamored to get into the establishment where Henry cooked. Quickly gaining a reputation as one of the most gifted chefs in the city, Lambert attracted the attention of the wealthiest and most powerful in New York's society. Three years flew by in money-soaked succession, and before he was able to really take stock of his meteoric success, the young French chef was offered a job as a personal cook for none other than the President of the United States. And so it was that Henry Lambert got a job managing the White House kitchen when Abraham Lincoln won the presidency in 1860. Lambert stuck to the President for the next five years, pulling together the best meals he could for Lincoln while the Civil War raged across the United States. Who knows how long he would have remained in Washington had not things turned out the way they did. Did his dreams of lighting out west seem like a distant fantasy, entertained by a much younger version of himself during his years at the White House? If they did, they came back strong in 1865. The very day it was announced that President Lincoln was dead, Lambert quit his job and left, turning his back on the East forever. Yet the hopes he had for striking it rich in the hills of Northern California were thwarted. While Henry was a brilliant chef, as a gold prospector he was inexperienced, uninformed, and plain unlucky. Lambert was destitute within a year of arriving at Sacramento, having been conned, robbed, and hoodwinked by every confidence man, highwayman, and six-gun near-do-well he came across. It turned out that the West wasn't nearly so grand as he had dreamt, so without a dollar or a gold nugget to his name, Lambert went back to doing what he did best. The once famous chef got to work in a San Francisco eatery and promptly began making magic of the local fare. Apparently his skills weren't lost in the rough palates of frontier men, and the establishment he worked at was soon bursting at the rafters with every gambler, gunfighter, and gold digger that could fit in the building. One of the customers, a wealthy New Mexican financier, enjoyed his meal so much that he walked into the kitchen after he was finished and offered Lambert an exorbitant sum to be his personal cook. Lambert didn't have to think about it too long. 
Taking a final look at the cramped and chaotic kitchen he had worked in, the chef walked out with his new employer, taking the next train out to Cimarron, New Mexico. He made more money working for his new employer than he did working for the president, and after a few years Henry had saved up a substantial sum. It was then that the master chef decided to open up an establishment of his own. Opening up Lambert Saloon and Billiard Club in the late 1870s, Henry suddenly found himself in the position to cook his goose's golden eggs and indulge his lifelong fascination with the Wild West. For Henry Saloon did a raucous business in the bustling town of Cimarron, which was located on the last stretch of the Santa Fe Trail. Lambert's establishment hardly bore any resemblance to past eateries he had worked in. More frontier drinking room than a restaurant, Lambert's selection of whiskeys and ales dwarfed his sparse menu of French cuisine. Most of the men who stepped into the saloon were more interested in cards and booze than fine food, and it wasn't long before Lambert Saloon became a famous gathering place for some of the worst men the Southwest had to offer. After its first few years of business, Lambert's operations was so successful that he added 30 more hotel rooms and renamed it to the St. James Hotel. The most infamous of the Old West perfidious pantheon would eventually walk through the St. James front door. Men such as Clay Allison, Wyatt Earp, Billy the Kid, and Pat Garrett all spent time under Lambert's roof at one time or another. In turn, Lambert traded in his spatula for a six-shooter and took to joining his dubious celebrity guests for booze and cards, fancying himself an honorary member of the Six Gun Brotherhood that whooped it up in his bar nightly. He was probably the most permissive barkeeper in all of Cimarron, and it is said that 26 men were killed in drunken shootouts that erupted within the saloon. Legend has it that the ceiling had to be replaced after the first couple of years because of the 400-some bullets holes punched through it. Lambert was probably happiest during this period of his life, laughing, drinking, and gambling with the same scoundrels he worshipped. The former cook drank up the company of these frontiersmen with unbridled zeal, but like all good things, his days under the western sun did not last. The end of his glory days came quickly, and at all the time it took for a man to throw down five cards on a table. Though Thomas Wright carried a six-shooter, he never used it. One of the more accomplished gamblers west of the Mississippi, Wright made his living at the card tables across the frontier. He played in practically every gambling house from Tombstone to Dodge City, and was known for his fair play and his outsized personality. So it was that Wright was one of those few men who could boast that having won the last dollar off murderous gamblers like Ben Thompson and Doc Holliday without a single altercation. He could never imagine his clean track record was about to change when he was introduced to a drunk and merry Henry Lambert, who gave Wright an affectionate hug when he met him. For that matter, Lambert couldn't have imagined it either. Indeed, with a six to ten straight flush in his hand, the former cook could imagine anything besides the small fortune he was about to win about to win no less from thomas wright the pot built steadily as the bets went around the table men threw in hundred dollar bills watches gold nuggets precious jewels by the time it came around to lambert for the second time the chef decided to make a grand statement about the cards in his hand basking in the attention of the spectators the south man let a moment of dramatic silence pass before he made his bet i would like to bet the title deed of this hotel much to Lambert's delight, a collective gasp went through the gambling room, as if the St. James itself had drawn its breath in disbelief. By the time the chef wrote up a hasty deed on a piece of paper, all the other men at the table had folded, unable or unwilling to match the excess of bet. All that is except Tom Wright. Eyeing up Henry Lambert with a lopsided grin stretched across his face, Wright reached into his jack pocket and pulled out a wad of folded hundred-dollar bills that looked thick enough to stop a bullet. The legendary gambler paused for a moment before he threw the money down. I wouldn't normally ask. But you sure you want to do this, Frenchie? Lambert felt beads of sweat forming on his brow in spite of himself. Your bluffing was all he could get out. So be it, Tom Wright said as he threw the cash onto the middle of the table. I call. Lambert laid his straight flush down, finally allowing his mouth to break out into a joyful guffaw. Beat that, you old card shark. He hollered at his opponent. Henry was just about to lean forward and grab his loot when Tom Wright threw his cards down. He was holding a royal flush, all spades. Nothing personal, Frenchy, Tom said to the suddenly pale chef, but I'll be wanting you out of here by tomorrow. 
A bet's a bet, after all. Tom reached forward to grab the loot when Lambert snapped. You cheat! The enraged Frenchman roared at his opponent. There's no way you could have drawn a royal flush. Lambert was stammering as he spoke, unable to come to terms with his loss. When Tom made another movement to take his winnings, Lambert ordered two of the house toughs to hold him back. Search his sleeves, he yelled at his thugs. I'll bet anything he's got cards in his jacket. I wouldn't be making any more bets for a while if I were you, Tom said to Lambert as the two burly men rifled through his jacket. There were no cards on him. Well, that settles it then, he said. Fair and square, huh, Pierre? I'm going upstairs to get some sleep. Get out of my hotel, Lambert screamed at the professional gambler as he walked away. Hell, Henry, you can't kick me out of my own place, Tom answered over his shoulder. A few men in the saloon laughed. Lambert flipped his lid. An instant later, the chef reached down to his hip, with shaking hands, yanked his shooting iron and fired, blowing a hole through Tom's back. Silence descended over the hotel as the patrons took in the spectacle of Wright and his death throes on the saloon floor. But no one was more shaken than the perpetrator of the capital crime. Unable to soak in what he had done, Lambert dropped his gun and dashed out of the saloon, leaving a writhing Tom Wright behind him. Well, someone said, we best take him to his room. A few men stepped forward, lifting the dying man off the floor and taking him to his hotel suite, room 18. If Wright was a congenial man throughout his life, there was nothing graceful about the way he left the world. Thrashing violently in blood-soaked sheets, the gambler unleashed his pain and angered a series of profane epithets. Calling down the town of Cimarron, the establishment he was gunned down in, and, most of all, the yellow-bellied Frenchman who shot him in the back. A doctor was called in to see if anything could be done, but Wright was quickly deemed beyond help. A priest followed intent on giving the dying man his last rites, but Tom pulled his revolver and shouted every curse he could think of at the rapidly retreating priest. Hellfire of my soul ain't damned beyond any prayer. The livid man shrieked at the holy man's back. But by Lucifer and his burning host, I swear I'll come back to torment that lousy Frenchman. I swear it. At that moment, there wasn't a man in the bar who didn't believe him. Tom was dead before the night was up. Lambert returned to his hotel after a brief hiatus, planning to manage the establishment again, but things at the St. James would never be the same. For one, Henry Lambert had lost his jovial air. No longer... Did patrons hear his delirious laughter ring through the hotel on crowded nights? No longer did he walk among the frontier clientele with his put-on swagger, pressing palms and buying drinks. Indeed, Lambert spent more and more time in the confines of his kitchen, sitting in silence for entire evenings with a bottle of whiskey in his hands. In the end, this eager Western enthusiast found his own frontier experience too much to digest, and the rest of his days were spent in a haunted and heavy silence. But Lambert wasn't the only one who was haunted by the deceased gambler. Soon after, Tom Wright passed on, employees and patrons of the St. James Hotel became convinced that the dead man's spirit remained in the hotel to see through his dying curse. His presence was said to be especially strong in the first few years after he died. Employees would tell stories about being struck by some invisible force while they were working. Bottles of booze frequently flew off shelves and across a room shattering against the barroom walls. It wasn't uncommon for men playing cards at the table where Wright was dealt his last hand to bolt out of their seats and run out of the hotel screaming, letters saying that they felt a pair of ice-cold hands close around their throats. Yet of all the strange things that occurred, the most terrifying phenomena occurred in room 18. Patrons unfortunate enough to sleep in room 18 would never make it through the night. Invariably, they would come running out sometime in the early hours with some story about the angry man at the foot of the bed, or the thick cloud of menacing mist that floated through the room, turning the bedchamber into a veritable icebox. It wasn't long before Lambert had the room locked up for good, but even then, those suites adjacent to the cursed room had their fair share of strange goings on, and Lambert would warn guests staying in them about the unfriendly ghost that was known to appear there. Things went from bad to worse at the St. James Hotel. As the phenomena in the hotel intensified, Tom Wright's last words took on the weight of legend. It's the spirit of Tom Wright up there in room 18. Locals would say he said he'd come back from the dead to stick it to old Lambert. I guess that's what he's done. Others offered theories on the dead gambler's determination 
to see that Lambert made good on his bet, saying that if Wright couldn't take what was owed him in life, his spirit would do his darnest after death. And maybe Wright would have driven Lambert out of the hotel after all, if Lambert's wife Mary hadn't passed away when she did. By all accounts, the paranormal activity at the St. James lessened considerably after Mary Lambert died. While strange and unpleasant things still occurred regularly in room 18, bottles had stopped flying across the barroom and the attacks on patrons dropped off dramatically. Wright's angry ghost stopped appearing in the rooms next to 18. Moreover, other more pleasant stories began circulating about the St. James. Employees grew conscious of a mysterious helper that would help them with the work around the hotel. Chambermaids walking into rooms they were about to clean would find beds made with crisp, clean sheets, while the dirty linens would be piled neatly beside the door. Dishes suddenly acquired a mysterious tendency to clean themselves, and Henry Lambert put away the bottle and took up cooking again, once more putting his talents to good use with a wide array of new dishes he put on the menu. Guests noticed the changes as well. Some said they spotted a kind-looking middle-aged woman framed by a warm and comforting light. Anyone who spotted her would talk about the undeniable sense of well-being they felt when they saw her. Business picked up at the same James Hotel once again, and while room 18 was still off limits, the air around the locked door still whispered an intangible and ominous promise. There was almost no trace of the vicious spirit that haunted the hotel throughout much of the 1880s. The popular theory is that the spirit of Mary Lambert, always kind and gentle while alive, had taken up residence in her husband's hotel after she died, hoping to help the poor man deal with the sins of his past. Somehow she was able to ease Wright's angry presence with her own good-hearted influence. In this sense, the St. James became something of a paranormal battleground, where one woman's gentle ghost somehow managed to keep another fiercely malevolent spirit in check. Ever since and to this day, owners, employees, and guests of the St. James have expressed awareness of this two-sided ghostly element in the hotel. On one hand, there is the darkness that resides in the still barred room 18. While on the other, there is the calming spirit of Mary Lambert, who seems to have free reign over the rest of the building. Management has done everything it can to placate the angry right, while keeping Mary happy as well. Room 18 has been stocked with three of Tom Wright's favorite things in the world. A pack of playing cards, a shot glass, and a bottle of Jack Daniels. Meanwhile, guests staying in Mary Lambert's room are told only to make sure that they shut the window before they go to sleep. An open window is said to be the only thing that irritates Mary, who has been known to tap on the window until sleeping guests wake up and close it. A small price to pay for protection from Tom Wright's vengeance.